Hello and welcome to our live stream tonight. Uh, my name is Jody Williams and I am the co-chair for the First Nations Métis and Inuit Education Association of Ontario. I am really excited tonight uh, in, to continue in these really important conversations across the province with respect to treaty education. And just to give you a little bit of background about who we are as an organization. So we are a subject association um, in the area of indigenous education. And our goals are to provide um, excellent high quality resources and to provide opportunities um, such as this. Uh, normally they would be face to face, of course, but we are in different times. And so we've adapted to bring to you um, information through our new uh, live stream Zoom format. And, um, and just a, the other thing I wanted to mention about our organization is that our work is guided by our Elders Advisory Council. And this council is made up of um, residential school survivors, many are fluent in their language, and they really guide and direct the work that we do as an organization to make sure that what we provide to you, the public, is high quality and vetted um, material resources and support. So I'm very excited to um, introduce to you our guest tonight. So we are here with Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler, as well as Luke Hunter, who is the Director of Governance and Treaty Implementation um, with Anishinaabe Aski Nation, and they're going to be chatting with us tonight um, with specific reference to Treaty 5 and 9, but really diving into understanding um, the inequities that exist, why they exist, and importantly, what we can do in education and why this is such a critically important conversation to be having, and how we can use education to really mobilize and make changes for the future. So I'm going to now turn it over to our guests tonight who can introduce themselves. So Elvin, you are on mute. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, thank you, Jody, for inviting us. Um, and I'm really happy to be here. I'm here with uh, Luke Hunter. Luke is our uh, longtime uh, treaty researcher uh, at NAN. Um, so just uh, briefly uh, about who I am. Uh, right now, I, I have the honor of, of, of holding the office of Grand Chief for the Basque Nation uh, in Treaty Number 9 and also uh, uh, the Ontario portion of Treaty 5. Um, I'm from a small community uh, one of the smallest communities in that territory called Maspata, a small community of probably 200 people. Um, I'm a dad. We have uh, my, my wife, Tisa, and we are, we're blessed to have two, uh, two kids. And uh, we have two dogs who keep us very busy. You, you can probably hear them barking uh, in the background uh, uh, as I'm speaking here. Uh, and uh, right now we live in Thunder Bay. Uh, this is where we live and work. Um, and I'm going on to my second term as Grand Chief and uh, my term will be up uh, next uh, uh, next summer. But um, I'm just really glad to, to be a part of this uh, very uh, important conversation. So I'll just uh, maybe ask Luke to just introduce himself and we'll, we'll start. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Grand Chief. Um, just like the introductions. Uh, uh, my name is Luke Hunter. I'm originally from uh, Winnesco, Ontario, and I, I reside in uh, Timmins, Ontario, and I've been with NAN for uh, roughly about 20, 27 years, and um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm glad to be, I guess, participating at the, this, uh, this evening's uh, discussion, and certainly uh, uh, the work I do, I'm very familiar with the, uh, with the education uh, requirements and also the uh, uh, what the treaty says about education. Thank you. So I just want to begin. Yeah, I just want to be, uh, begin uh, by acknowledging the uh, the treaty territory that I'm in. Uh, as I said, I'm in Thunder Bay, 
uh, right across the river from Thunder Bay's uh, uh, Port William First Nation. So we're in the Robinson Superior uh, Treaty Territory. Uh, so as uh, I, I always take time to acknowledge uh, Chief Collins and the people of Port William First Nation for um, welcoming us into their, tor into their uh, territory for us to, uh, to live in and, and to work in. Uh, so I'm, I'm, that's where I am uh, this evening. Um, I also just want to begin by acknowledging all of you. Uh, I understand there's quite a few, uh, quite a few of you, uh, educators, teachers, that uh, um, have joined in for this webinar, and I acknowledge uh, the work uh, that you do. Uh, I know uh, being a teacher is uh, is tough, and uh, it's even more tougher, uh, you know, during this uh, global pandemic. Uh, that uh, uh, that we are in, and for you to carry on with the work uh, is, uh, is so important. And I know it's uh, it can be a, a, a bit uh, a bit dangerous, uh, as I said during uh, during this COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. So I acknowledge uh, you all, and I also know just how passionate teachers are. And believe me, I I, I live with one of them. Uh, my wife Tisa is one of the most passionate educators that I know and uh, she was talking to me this evening I was trying to prep prep for this uh, webinar and telling me all I should say then every once in a while she would ask me are you taking notes are you taking <laughs> notes <laughs> and I, I was pretending that I was in fact taking notes but uh, um, I know it's uh, you know it's a very important uh, job that you have probably the you know one of the most important professions that that uh, anyone can have, you know, and the uh, the power, the influence that you have over young minds is uh, is very important, and uh, and it's so important as as educators that you take the time to uh, educate yourself as well. And uh, this week, being a treaty week, is 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 an important uh, uh, is an important one because. Uh, if you are living in within the province of Ontario, uh, every square inch of the province is is treaty land. So that makes us all treaty people. And as treaty people, we have uh, uh, obligations and responsibilities, and it's important that all of us know what they are. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, this evening, uh, I'm not very big on, on talking. Like I, I have a hard time talking for five minutes, never, never mind an hour and a half. So I'm going to leave it to look to um, carry on with some of the conversations. And uh, we, we want to also give you as much time uh, that you need to engage uh, in this conversation with us. If you have any questions or comments, we'd be very happy to... Uh, to answer any of the questions that you may have. Uh, so just to give you an idea, um, what is NAN, Nishinaab Basque Nation? Um, we have a map here, so I'm counting on Jody and, and maybe look in their, in their wizardry to uh, put on the screen, just, uh, just to show you uh, our territory. It, it's, it's quite uh, vast when you look at the map of Ontario, then when you, uh, uh, look at uh, uh, you know Treaty Nine and, and Treaty Five that you know that that makes up uh, the land territory. It covers roughly two thirds of the province of Ontario, um, along the uh, the Quebec border, north to James Bay, then Hudson's Bay, then uh, and then down to the Manitoba border, then uh, to Red Lake and just north of Thunder Bay. So it's uh, it's quite vast. Uh, there's 49 First Nation communities uh, in, in, in the Nance Territory, uh, roughly 40,000 citizens that uh, are part of our territory. And we have um, different groupings called the tribal councils that are part of that. And for, for NAN, um, our governance structure is, uh, you know, we have a four-member executive, there's a grand chief, and then there's three deputy grand chiefs. 
Uh, and then we have uh, uh, three-year terms. We're elected by the 49 chiefs in assembly. Uh, that's how, that's how uh, NAN, uh, sort of the, the current sort of governance structure uh, is, is made of. Um, so we want to obviously focus on the treaty because that's, that's what, the, uh, what we're asked to, to talk about. Um, and I just want to start off by um, this telling you what the treaty uh, means, uh, what our ancestors were told when the treaty, the crown, the treaty commissioners came into our territory um, in 1905 and 1906. Uh, so NAN, Treaty 9 is in two parts. So the first part of the treaty is sort of in the southern part up to the Albany River. Um, that was signed in 1905 and 1906. And then um, they, they realized that there's more land further north of the Albany River. So they came back again, uh, you know, 20, uh, 27 years later in 1929 and 1930, which is called the adhesion of Treaty Number no. 9. Uh, so that, uh, so between uh, 1905 and 1906 and 1929, 1930, that that fully makes up what NAN is today, Treaty 5 or Treaty 9. Um, <clears throat> and my late father, uh, his name was Moses uh, Fiddler. He was just a young, just a young kid uh, when he witnessed the signing of the treaty uh, in Victoria Lake in 1929, in summer of 1929. And he used to talk about um, and the elders today, they passed on this knowledge to us, you know, what they saw and what they heard uh, at the time of the signing of the treaty. You know, it, there's a, the treaty documents uh, themselves. Uh, for example, here, this, are, this is a treaty five document. So there's, there's documents that we have, but we also have uh, the knowledge that's been uh, passed on to us uh, by people like my, my dad and elders that, you know, when we talk about the spirit and intent of the treaty, that, that sort of the what they understood, what this meant for them, uh, and more importantly for future uh, for future generations when they sign on. So there's three things: um, what the treaty represents for us, and and for you as well. First of all, it's it's we agreed um, to peacefully coexist that there would be no conflicts, there would be no fighting, uh, that we would live together uh, in this uh, beautiful land. Uh, the second one was that th there would be mutual benefit. You know, there would be mutual that, uh, that both sides would, would benefit from this agreement, which, led, which leads me to the third point, uh, and that's prosperity. You know, that all of us, you know, if, if all of us honor the terms of the treaty, all of us would prosper uh, from, from that agreement, from that sacred agreement. That was uh, the, uh, uh, that's the whole idea of what the, of what the treaty uh, means to us. And there were promises that were made um, in different areas, promises on healthcare, you know, there were promises that uh, that our people would not be, you know, I think the word in the treaty document is, is molested while they're pursuing their, their way of life, to harvest, to uh, look after their families. Uh, and there was also promises uh, on education. You know, that, you know, the Crown agreed to build buildings in, in, our, in our communities and that they would pay salaries of, of the teachers to work there. You know, it doesn't say anything about that they would fund schools from grade one to grade kindergarten or grade eight or high school. It just says schools uh, and, and the salaries. Uh, and look, we'll um, get into uh, more details around, around uh, those, those treaty clauses on education. Um, so if you fast forward, you know, uh, 100 and 
18 years, you know, 115 years. As you can see, math wasn't my, my strongest subject in high school. Um, and, and I hope some of you have taken the time getting ready for this webinar, uh, especially those of you that reside and work in Southern Ontario to get to know more about the Schneiderbass Nation and the communities that we represent, where we live. Because you will see that in a lot of cases, the Crown has not fulfilled their obligations, their responsibilities on what they agree to uh, in, in, the signing, uh, in the signing of these, of these treaties, whether it's Treaty 5 or Treaty 9. Uh, that they failed in, in many areas, including education. Um, and if you follow the news, you, you probably hear once in a while about some of the things that, that I'm talking about. For example, uh, you know, the seven students that died here in Thunder Bay while attending high school because there was no high school for them in their communities. And whenever I talk about the seven youth, um, I always take the time to uh, name who they are, where they came from. So the first student that we lost in, in 2000 when uh, DFC Dennis Franklin Camardi High School opened up, opened its doors uh, that year in 2000. Um, a month and a half later, uh, Jethro Anderson from Casablanca went missing and was found uh, deceased in the river a few days later. And then Curran Strang from Pekanchkum and Paul Panachis from Michigan, Robin Harper from uh, Kiwewin, Kyle Morriso from Kiwewin, Jordan Wabas from uh, Webukwe and, and Reggie Bushy from uh, Pauper Hill. And we knew these kids. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, my wife Tisa uh, was, you know, you know, is a teacher and, and, and started off uh, working at and teaching at DFC and knew these kids uh, like George Mabas and Reggie Bushy and Cal Morso. And, you know, where these kids came from, um, you know, many of them came from very tough uh, places, you know, that they struggled and they came and they came from uh, small communities uh, and they had to leave their families behind their communities behind uh, to come to high school in Thunder Bay which is to me uh, I also came to high school here in Thunder Bay when I was in grade 12 and it's like Thunder Bay is like a metropolis so it was just a huge place compared to where I came from and that's what these um, these students experienced as well uh, you know, many of them didn't even have winter clothing, for example, when, it, you know, like today, even though it's still October, it's, it's pretty cold here in Thunder Bay. Uh, it's windy. Um, and a lot of them didn't, don't even have proper winter, winter gear. Uh, and one of the things that I, we remember Kyle more so is because of, uh, you know, one day um, Tisa came home from school and told us about me about him and that he needed a jacket the winter coat so we gave it to him and then uh a few days later she invited or he invited Tisa to come to where he was staying and wanted to give her a gift and i'm not sure if you can see it on the screen but this is uh cal morso's uh this is cal, Mor cal morso's painting that he gave to uh tisa as a gift, uh, I guess, uh, sort of to acknowledge um, the gift that he got from her uh, with the winter coat. So this is one of our most uh, prized uh, possessions that we have. And when we look at it, um, you know, it, it's hanging in our dining room here. Uh, we think about him and we think about Cal and we think about all the, the other, um, students that have died here in Thunder Bay. Um, and it's not just them, it's, it's also 
many other many other kids that have had to leave. For example, uh, Shannon Kustajan. You know, Shannon. Uh, I hope some of you or many of you have heard about Shannon's dream. Um, Shannon was uh, this young girl from uh, Arawabasket along the coast, and uh, again, um, you know, she had to leave at a very young age, and uh, or she was going to school in Arawabasket. At the time, uh, there was just a bunch of uh, mobile units, of trailers, because the school in Arawabasket had been contaminated by, by fuel, and so it wasn't safe for her uh, and, and her classmates to go to school there. So they were forced to uh, uh, attend classrooms, to attend school, and just makeshift uh, trailers. And she became uh, very strong and uh, uh, an effective advocate uh, for education, uh, not just in Ottawa, Ottawa but right across, uh, right across the Nan territory and right across the region, and even right across the country now that uh, uh, as, as her work becomes more and more known. And uh, again, she had to leave her community at a very young age. And while she was uh, going to high school uh, at the age of 15, she uh, died in a car crash uh, in, uh, not in Timmins, I forget where it was, uh, Luke, uh, outside of Timmins. New Liskert, outside New Liskert. Yeah, New Liskert. That's where she was going to school along with uh, uh, one of her sisters. So this is, uh, you know, when, we, when you talk about uh, the failures of the Crown to fulfill their obligations on education, it's not only delivering uh, bad education, but it, it, it's 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 costing uh, lives of our of our students, and these are real kids, these are real families that uh, that have had to uh, uh, live with this. And so, our job, um, our responsibility that we have at Dan is uh, is to make sure that these horrendous gaps that exist um, are addressed, whether it's in infrastructure or on, um, on standards. In fact, uh, I have to leave here in seven minutes. I'm doing a CBC, uh, a media, I'm doing a media thing uh, in about five minutes uh, to talk about um, the water situation in the Scandia. And so when you talk about the conditions that our students are in, are currently in, uh, whether they're on reserve or whether they have to come out to places like Timmins or Cochrane or Sulaco or Dryden or Thunder Bay, uh, it's, it's very challenging. Um, so the, you know, in terms of, um, the task that's in front of us, uh, it may seem, uh, you know, overwhelming sometimes. It, it you know it may seem that it, it's just an impossible thing to do. But uh, uh, we remember, um, you know, these seven youth. We remember Shannon's dream and and what she, her dream was that all children and men uh, go to a school that is safe. Uh, that they have, you know, that they receive good quality education, uh, and that uh, that they're going to be successful. You know that we create that uh, that pathway forward for them to be successful. And to me, that uh, it gets a bit frustrating sometimes um, when we talk about the work that needs to be done. So, for example, here in Thunder Bay, uh, as you know. Uh, after years and years of fighting the provincial government to hold an inquest into, into these seven deaths of these kids, it finally happened. And I was involved and Tisa and I were, were personally involved in that fight. And what's frustrating for me is that why did seven kids have to die? Like if two kids died or three kids, 
you know, that should have been reason enough to look into why this was going on, why this is happening. But it was only until after uh, Reggie Bushy uh, died that his family came to Thunder Bay. And then, uh, you know, it was through them, the parents, uh, Rhoda and Berenson were the, the mom and dad. Of that first uh, issue, that call, that something needs to be done. But the province didn't say yes right away. After after they issued that call, um, you know, we, we lost Kyle after that. And Jordan and Robin, so three more kids, three more students lost their lives uh, before they finally agreed to an inquest. And that inquest happened uh, five years ago, almost four five years ago. And they issued, I think, 143 recommendations. It was a in the history of, of the province of Ontario. It was the longest, the the sort of the biggest uh, death inquiry that that happened. But here we are, um, four years later after the A report came out, we're still struggling with, you know, we're still fighting, in some cases fighting with uh, the province and, and the federal government to agree on a plan to fully implement uh, those recommendations. And, and those meetings are still happening. I, I, I've made it a point of personally chairing those meetings and just uh, holding, uh, government bureaucrats accountable to do to do their job and to uh, work with us on the Im implementation of these uh, of these uh, of these recommendations so that's one one aspect of the work that we're doing another thing that, that we are doing now and, and look we'll talk into or talk more about the agreements that we've signed uh, with uh, with the federal government um, to dismantle and to decolonize our education system. Because we know, and we've known this for a long time, that the current structures are not working for us. They were never designed for us. In fact, they are harming our kids. And what we need to do is we need to dismantle the, the education systems, even though um, the federal government back in the 80s, uh, what they call through their devolution policy, handed over the responsibilities of education to most of our communities, but it wasn't done in a good way. You know, it was just handing, uh, it would be like me, you know, handing over my, my beat up broken car to my daughter, Allison, and then she would be in danger if she was driving that broken, beaten down car. You know, it wasn't it wasn't uh, done in a good way. And, and since that time, many of our communities have been struggling to deliver um, a, a good education system for their kids. So we want to do it right. We want to, uh, as I said, we need to dismantle and, and decolonize uh, these systems and, and their place uh, to rebuild a, a system that uh, that's going to work for us. And, um, you know, and that's where the education transformation process is now taking shape, similar to the health transformation uh, process that we started four years ago. Uh, so we're, we're a bit ahead in health. Uh, we hired uh, uh, our lead negotiator by the name of, uh, his name is Ovid Mercury, a former uh, national chief. Uh, and, and he's put together a team that uh, is really moving forward um, and transforming healthcare, and 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 uh, in this time of nation. And I started off by acknowledging you uh, and the pandemic that we are in. Um, you know what I think what we what this pandemic has shown is that the gaps that existed in our communities are even more pronounced now uh, during this pandemic. Um, so that's the work that we're doing. So Luke, we'll talk about. I'm going to disappear for a bit. But I'm going to come back in about 10 minutes. So, uh, uh, Luke, the, the floor is yours, and I'll, I'll see you guys in about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, sounds that's, good. That's great. 
Luke, just before you speak there, I just, um, thank you so much, Alvin. I just want to really remind people, like, think about so where is Alvin going right now? He's got to go and have another interview because we have communities that don't have clean water. And I think for the people who are listening in, you know, when we, when we talk about, yeah, if you want to just put it on mute, Alvin. <laughs> thank you. Just put yourself on mute there. Um, you know, what do you have to do for your basic human rights? Are, do you have to um, live without clean drinking water, access to just basic services? Um, these are the realities that are happening right now. And I just wanna remind people that we have an opportunity in education to really radically change how um, this place is doing things. And to consider ways that you're bringing this education into your classrooms and how can you inspire your students to get active, to do something, to say something. Um, you know, we talk about literacy skills. So let's get those literacy skills working and do some writing to um, MPs or other government officials as, um, you know, these are, there's so many things that as non-Indigenous or Canadians can do through education to call out these um, massive human rights abuses that are taking um, that are taking place today. So I just wanted to um, say that, and uh, we're now going to turn it over to Luke to consider continue this conversation. Okay, thank you, thank Luke. you, uh, thank you Jody, and uh, good night, everybody. Um, as uh, Grand Chief said. Um, <clears throat> That there is a promise in the treaty for the Crown to provide uh, education for Treaty 9 and, and Treaty 5 communities. Uh, the Treaty 5 communities that we represent uh, include a um, portion of uh, north, uh, northwestern Ontario. Uh, as of 1912, when Ontario extended their boundaries, um, some of the uh, Treaty 5 communities became part of Ontario. So, so that's why uh, 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 northern northwest uh, portion uh, is uh, is uh, cut off from the uh, from the uh, the Manitoba site. So so those communities, I think about seven of them, uh, uh, Nishabi Nation, represent them as part of the uh, our organization. Um, the uh, despite the, uh, those assurances by the Crown that the education will be provided, uh, uh, there they are jurisdictional challenges uh, that Alvin talked about and also barriers and inequities. Uh, some of them, some of the inequities uh, were touched on by the Grand Chief. Um, uh, th there is, and, and our communities face uh, uh, every day, uh, gaps in delivery of education in the far north. And a lot of the uh, deliveries that, the, the, that, uh, that are basic, for example, uh, teachers, qualified teachers, um, there's a not, not uh, there's an issue of recruiting uh, qualified teachers. Uh, e even if uh, First Nation does recruit teachers, qualified teachers, uh, they end up uh, quitting or uh, or not even going to the community uh, because of the, uh, the the low pay uh, offers that they receive compared to. Uh, uh, down south school boards, school boards can afford uh, adequate salaries as opposed to uh, First Nations. They, they have a hard time uh, matching uh, those uh, salary expectations from the uh, from southern teachers. So those are just the basic uh, inequities that, uh, that, that, uh, that the communities uh, face in the far north. Um, so the, uh, as, uh, as the Grand Chief alluded that, uh, alluded that uh, Treaty promises has not been fulfilled, even though that is clear in the in the treaties, both uh, Treaty Nine and Five. Uh, for example, if you uh, uh, look at the, the clause, uh, the, both of those treaties. Uh, for example, Treaty Nine it says uh, His Majesty agrees to pay such salaries of, of teachers to instruct uh, the children of the said Indians and also to provide such school buildings and educational equipment as may seem advisable to His Majesty uh, uh, Government of Canada. 
so so that's it's pretty clear that uh, the crown is responsible for for, uh, for education for, for the 39 beneficiaries and also for the treaty five it says that his her majesty uh, agrees to maintain schools for instructions for instruction in such reserves here hereby made as to her government of the dominion of canada may seem advisable whenever the indians of the reserve shall desire it so alvin talked about the uh, grand chief talked about the, uh, the seven years inquest i i was asked to uh, to provide uh, as an expert witness on the interpretation of those clauses and uh, and both of those uh, clauses i highlighted that you know, those clauses are clearly uh, indication of the uh, crown's uh, uh, duty, uh, fiduciary duty to provide uh, those services. Uh, but despite those uh, uh, assurances, um, the crown has failed to uh, deliver the proper education to uh, to those uh, beneficiaries of those communities. Um, even uh, during the treaty. Uh, First Nations understood that education would provide uh, would provide for them as they knew that the uh, when the settlers were coming into their territory uh, and they felt uh, before even the treaty uh, were uh, signed that there was already encroachment in, in their uh, territories. Uh, uh, roads were coming in and rail railroads were also coming in and also uh, uh, mining companies were 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 encroaching on their hunting and uh, trapping territories, so they knew that education would be uh, would be one of those uh, benefits that would uh, would provide uh, for them in the future. Uh, one of the quotes in the uh, from the uh, counselor or from the leadership leader that uh, was present at the uh, treaty um, knew that the uh, hell that uh, by signing the treaty uh, that education would, would uh, provide uh, good things and good things would come out of it. Uh, John Dick remarked that, uh, that one of the great advantages of, the, uh, of, the, of them signing the treaty uh, would derive uh, from the treaty was to establish uh, the establishment of schools whereby their, their children might receive an education. So this was in most factory in, uh, in August uh, 1905. And also the, uh, when we did our uh, uh, research into elders, uh, how they understood uh, how education was promised. Um, the elders uh, reported that they were promised schools, teachers for their children. Uh, many uh, elders also report that they expected that the schools would be provided soon after the treaty was made. Uh, commissioner Scott, on uh, Scott, who was a treaty commissioner, on the other hand, wrote in his diary uh, of his visit in, in to Moose Factory that uh, commissioners explained uh, when they were ready for the same schools would be established for the purpose of educating the, their uh, their children. So in the years uh, following the, the treaty, it became evident that it would be the Department of Indian Affairs who, who was responsible for uh, managing uh, uh, in the Indians in, in the territory. Uh, uh, would, uh, would decide, uh, basically it would be the department that would make those, those decisions. Essentially, uh, a First Nation was not deemed to be ready to have a school until their people began to permanently settle on their reserves. Uh, this policy was neither explained nor understood by uh, by the our, our elders or our or, or our uh, people that uh, that signed the treaty, and this would lead to much uh, disappointment in, in later years. For example, one of the communities that signed the treaty uh, number nine. Uh, first, uh, which is the Mishkyoga Mine, uh, requested a school uh, one year after the treaty. And uh, they were told that the school was not, uh, had not been requested at the time of treaty, even though it was clearly written in the, in the text. 
and that the and that the commissioner said uh, the Indian agent basically said uh, he he would refer that matter to Ottawa. So by 1910, this is uh, roughly five years after uh, uh, the ban uh, signed uh, uh, the treaty that they, they had completed their own school uh, using their own material. Uh, part of that it was the help of the church, uh, the churches. And then when they informed uh, the Indian agent that they expected a teacher, um, the, the teacher uh, for, for the department, uh, for the department to, uh, to provide, um, the Indian agent uh, noted that, uh, that, 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 that uh, request was, uh, was uh, uncalled for. So it wasn't until much later uh, that the uh, schools would be provided. Uh, this was much after the uh, uh, 30 or 40 years has passed that the department began to uh, provide uh, uh, school buildings. Uh, when the adhesion was uh, made in the, uh, 1929 and 30, uh, which is the second part of the uh, Treaty 9, um, uh, the chief there that signed in Victoria Lake uh, requested a new school uh, but the Indian agent uh, uh, discounted uh, that request. Um, so, so you have a, a lot of these uh, requests by First Nations immediately, uh, shortly after the treaty was signed, but they were told that uh, that request uh, cannot be granted. But, but that uh, policy was never explained to, uh, to, to those First Nations that uh, did sign that, that treaty. And, uh, and also there, there was no evidence that uh, the commissioners explained to the people that they would uh, only receive the, the school, uh, the school if they were willing to aban abandon their traditional harvesting activities and live on the reserve permanently. Nor did the Department uh, Affairs conceive that an education system would uh, meddle uh, with the uh, traditional lifestyle of the Shabieski uh, people. Uh, they did uh, not, for example, consider uh, employing a teacher who, who could travel uh, from camp to camp to give instruction while, while the children were in their parents on their trapping grounds. So, so that was never made clear that, uh, that the department would not provide uh, that kind of uh, uh, service. Uh, part of that is the, uh, the, the, to save money. Um, to, to, uh, as a cost-saving measure. Uh, the, uh, the, the elders also understood that uh, education uh, provided by the government uh, would assist the younger generation by teaching them the skills uh, necessary to meet uh, the future. Uh, there is no evidence that the elders agreed with the notion that in order to receive an education, education assistance their, their children would have to abandon their uh, Aboriginal language and culture. So we hear this from uh, elders uh, that when the commissioners promised uh, the, the children would receive schooling, uh, they did not specify what type of uh, education system that they would, uh, uh, that what they were referring to. Uh, it wasn't until later on um, that, that they, you uh, know, started to uh, know uh, what uh, what it was uh, what the government uh, had uh, planned um, and also uh, many of the elders that, that, that we interviewed expressed disappointment and griefed over the fact that you know, the, the, the children would no longer you know, be taught the values and the skills of their you know, forefathers have done. Uh, uh, silver, uh, silver I mean, some of the elders also express concern that uh, uh, today's children are not uh, equipped to live off the land and that the same and the same uh, at the same time not able to make a living in their community. Uh, for example, one of the elders from uh, Fort Severn, this is the far north community, one of our far north communities, uh, remarked that, uh, that the children today can be called a, a sandwich. Uh, Sanders generation because they are caught between 
the way the way of the life of their parents and and grandparents and the modern day society uh, and and in many uh, instances are not fully equipped uh, for the either so 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 one of the uh, one of the uh, i guess uh, also how uh, the elders express is the is the fact that uh, that they didn't expect uh, how their children would be taken away from them and sent off to have schools in the city. Um, so we all know in the uh, what happened in the uh, in the Western United school system uh, that, that was never uh, I guess explained in, in at the time of treaty. So it wasn't until uh, many uh, many years later that uh, uh, when when the request for schools, was was demanded by by the communities. The Indian agent refused some of those uh, requests, and also at the same time, uh, if families refuse to uh, send their kids to uh, western school or day schools, uh, the assistance that the government provided were withheld. So so you see uh, you see these uh, games that the government uh, or tools that government used to. Uh, uh, I guess to get the uh, parents to send their kids to school. So this type of uh, arbitrary enforcement uh, served to further undermine the, uh, the the traditional education system that uh, was practiced by uh, by our First Nations prior to the uh, signing of the treaty. Um, I'm just going to go through the uh, some of the uh, I guess background to the. Uh, the history of the how education was delivered. Um, the delivery of education started by by the missionaries, the arrival of the missionaries initially, and then then the introduction of the uh, Indian Western school system. Um, but but in the uh, in the 1950s, uh, these schools became more prominent, and that, that's when. Uh, the Department of Indian Affairs started to uh, look at the uh, uh, day school uh, system to be implemented on reserves. But in the early uh, 80s, um, when government uh, started to, uh, well, First Nations started to demand uh, Indian control of education, uh, they introduced uh, the uh, devolution process whereby First Nations can uh, take over uh, the education system. By 1992, the department was no longer uh, responsible for the delivery of education at the, at the communities, at the community level. So all that responsibility fell to the, uh, to, to the First Nations. Uh, there was only very few that I know in, in Canada that department still runs the schools. Uh, I believe there's one in Six Nations, uh, one in uh, uh, just outside of Toronto, one in, uh, I believe, in Treaty 7. So there's only very limited uh, areas, but but mostly today, uh, First Nations run their own schools with the uh, transfer payments made by by uh, by the department. And even these, uh, even though First Nations control their, their education uh, funding, uh, there's still a shortfall in funding and continues to, uh, uh, the First Nations continue to uh, administer uh, education that's not uh, appropriately funded and then they have a hard time uh, running those uh, uh, services. The, uh, one of the uh, things too that happened in the, in the, in, in the, and, and all, all of this, uh, I guess, uh, the, the federal uh, transfer to education is that uh, uh, they had a cap on the, uh, on funding. Uh, First Nation receive uh, uh, their education on uh, on uh, elementary, uh, high school, and, and, post, and to some extent uh, post secondary. Uh, a lot of the the funding uh, currently. Uh, uh, administered by First Nations uh, are not adequately funded. 
uh, there's a huge shortfall and, and most of those, uh, most of the uh, transfer payments. Um, I just want to get into just a little bit about the, uh, uh, I guess on the, what the treaty says and, and, and uh, I, I went through the, uh, the, the clause, but, uh, but for treaty nine, uh, the, there is clear, uh, I guess, uh, a clause that, that says that uh, schools will be provided uh, and teacher salaries will be paid. But those, uh, uh, I guess, promises went through a transfer payments but the reality is, is not the hell, it's not there. Um, okay, First Nations continue to be underfunded. And uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, there's an issues of uh, retaining uh, teachers uh, or properly qualified teachers. Uh, they, they just simply cannot, uh, cannot afford uh, to match uh, uh, salaries that are uh, provided by uh, school boards in the South. Um, I talked about the yes and the uh, I'll, uh, I'll go into uh, some of those uh, um, uh, I guess inequities. Um, uh, I know the grand chief talked about some of them. Um, uh, the uh, the other one is the uh, the infrastructure. Um, that there's just none well departments I guess the crown or the government's argument is that there's simply not enough well, money to go around to build new schools or, or to fix new schools because um, uh, the department is responsible I guess across nationally over 600 and roughly 633 First Nations across Canada so just imagine that uh, over 600 First Nations across Canada and the and the amount of funding that, uh, that the government provides is just not enough to uh, to meet all the needs. Um, the uh, I guess that's in terms of uh, uh, I know we're coming into uh, eight o'clock. So, um, so as in terms of the uh, as moving forward, uh, the Grand Chief talked about uh, reform. Uh, I know when the uh, when the Liberals were elected in 2015, uh, that that was their big pitch to uh, to undo the uh, the freeze on the on the funding gap and also to catch up on some of those uh, I guess uh, inadequate uh, funding levels on education. Uh, right now, there's two processes happening. Um, Currently, and there's that national education reform that's happening across the board. Uh, Assembly First Nation and provincial uh, territory organizations are examining the, the education gap uh, to bring the education services to First Nations that will be at least comparable to each provincial jurisdiction. So that, that, that's the plan. Uh, but the, this exercise will, uh, still does not adequately address the unique circumstances of, of our First Nation, especially when you talk about uh, a huge territory. Um, a majority of our First Nations are, uh, are remote and, and fly in communities. So, so there's a cost in the uh, uh, delivery of education that's much different uh, to a road access community or even the South. And the other initiative that NAN is engaging is the uh, education jurisdiction negotiations. Uh, the, the, the goal on that is to move away from the current program delivery uh, that, that, that is currently not sustainable and, uh, and, and control the lawmaking to, to NAN First Nations. Um, this is currently happening right now. We're in negotiation with the federal government to... Uh, to have, to have uh, First Nations run their own uh, HK system and also to uh, provide a, a fiscal uh, a arrangement where First Nations can adequately run the, uh, their, their programs and services. Um, I guess the overall goal is to allow nine First Nations that participate in the uh, and that agreement is to move away from the Indian Act uh, related uh, to education uh, provisions uh, 
Uh, much of the, uh, uh, I guess, control by the Crown relates to their, I guess, uh, federal powers. Uh, the, the federal government has uh, constitutional powers under Section 9124 that talks about uh, Indians and, uh, and reserves. So it's true that uh, constitutional power where they can uh, pass laws, which is the Indian Act. Under the Indian Act, there are education provisions and we want to get away from, from those provisions and we want to be able to create our own laws. So, so that's transferring uh, transformation of education that the Grand Chief talked about. So, so, so that's happening in the in education. So, the, so we hope that the final agreement uh, will recognize uh, that, uh, that, that jurisdiction, uh, certainly uh, over education. And, and the goal is to negotiate uh, a fiscal agreement that will be sustainable in the long term uh, to properly deliver uh, education uh, services to our communities. Um, I think that's pretty well. I'm not sure if there's any. Uh, I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to uh, carry on too long. Yeah. But, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Doc. I yeah. just want to before we open up, uh, Jude. I just want to uh, just. Again, bring us back to where we are today uh, with respect to treaties and uh, how how important it is for for the crown to honor the terms of the treaty. Um, whether it's on education, whether it's on healthcare, whether it's on our, our rights to harvest, and uh, I know many of you on on uh, the educators, teachers, you you've seen on TV, you've seen in the news of what's happening in the East Coast, and uh, last week. Uh, we had our first ever uh, virtual NAN Chiefs Assembly, uh, where we had 49 of our chiefs uh, on, on the Zoom call. Um, and we were very honored to have uh, Chief uh, Mike Zach and his full council join us on that call. And their struggle that we see unfolding in front of us in terms of their right to harvest uh, fish and lobster to to feed themselves or to make uh, a modest living. That's the uh, you know it, it's not just a it's not just a, a fishing or a lobster issue. It's a much bigger issue. It it affects all of us because uh, you know uh, when we talk about I mentioned earlier uh, when, when I did my opening uh, comments about. The promises that were made to us you know, that we would, you know, the word and, and, and the treaty document is unmolested, that we, we would not be molested in and, and, and the pursuit of, of to harvest, uh, to feed our families, uh, to uh, look after ourselves, to, to be self sustaining uh, communities. And that's what we're seeing play out uh, right now on the East Coast. And and Luke uh, talked a little bit about the uh, I think you were touching on the, uh, the 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 policing the RCMP and and historically what their role has been whether it's coming into our homes and taking kids away from the arms of their parents and taking them far away places to residential schools that's the history that's their history and what we're seeing now. In the East Coast, while uh, Chief Zach is being assaulted, while his people are being under assault, while their equipment is being damaged, while, while their warehouse is being burned down, what do you see the RCMP doing? Nothing. They are standing by and letting these attacks happen on Indigenous people in the East Coast. So that's that's our that's our reality. And we live it every day. And I saw someone uh, earlier, I think it was last week, write in their social media that, you know, just out of frustration, out of, I'm not sure if it was out of anger, that if, if, if you're getting tired about hearing about racism and seeing racism on TV, just imagine living with it every day. And, 
tomorrow uh, morning I'll be going to the uh, Victoria Inn to again speak with the evacuees from the Scandiga, the 200 or so uh, individuals that are forced to relocate to Thunder Bay because there is no water, absolutely no water in their community. And that's what racism looks like. You know, sometimes it's, it's casual, and sometimes it's systemic, and for us to, to change all that, that's where education, that's where you guys come in. That's where education can be such a powerful tool to make that change. And so I would just encourage you teachers and educators to, to be brave, to, to be courageous, and how you shape the minds of the students that are in your classrooms, whether it's in person or I know right right now uh, with this pandemic, it's 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 a lot of it is online. But you have that opportunity to speak the truth, to tell the truth, and to teach it. And I know that you are obligated as teachers to follow a curriculum that in some cases is, is 50 years old. I know there's been a lot of, of work uh, you know, done over the last few years or so to try to begin to make changes to that so that you're able to teach your students about what happened in these residential schools, to teach them about the Indian Act, to teach them about you know, the, what we're seeing right now. You know, that's, that's the true history of this country. It's not about Columbus getting on a sailboat and discovering America. You know, it's not that. You know, that's what I learned when I was in high school. Uh, I went to high school in Solok out in, in Thunder Bay for my grade 12 and never once during the four years that I went to high school, never once did a teacher talk to me or teach me about treaty or about the 60s scoop or about the Indian Act or about you know, the, what really happened. And I think we have an obligation now to change all that, to make sure that every, in this case, every kid from Ontario or every kid from Canada knows what really happened and that they know the importance of treaty, that we all have, you know, we all have a responsibility, we all have an, an obligation to make sure that the terms of these treaties, in our case Treaty 9 and 5, are, are honored and are respected. Yeah, I talked about what's happening and what's unfolding in the East Coast that can easily happen up here in the land territory. Many of you I know have heard about the Ring of Fire. You know, this is the, the largest sort of discovery, modern day discovery of, of precious metals of chromite and gold and diamonds in this, and right in the middle of the land territory. And that's what Ontario and I, I know in Canada, that's what they're eyeing on as they try to find ways to replenish their coffers. I know, you know, with this pandemic, many of them or you know, those governments, Ontario and Canada, have spent a lot of money fighting this pandemic, but they need to replenish their coffers and they're, and they're looking at us. They're looking at our territory. In fact, uh, about a month ago, there was a mine opening in uh, near Gogama and, and Matagami First Nation, and both the Prime Minister and Premier Doug Ford were there. And this, the significance of that, you know, why would the Prime Minister and the Premier show up at a, you know, at a mine opening? You know, that, that uh, to me, that, that said a lot, and that's going to be, I think, the future that that's in store for us. That if we don't make the right, the, if we don't create the right environment for this to happen, there's going to be conflict. Uh, that's my fear, and uh, we need to make sure that we create the right environment, as I said, for the treaties to be respected so that there's uh, mutual benefit and prosperity. And education to me is is uh, the key and just a closing I guess I, 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 we welcome you know your questions your comments but 
I was able to, I was fortunate about 10 years ago to work for the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for a couple of years. And I traveled across the country with, uh, with Justice uh, Sinclair and the other commissioners, uh, hearing from survivors directly, taking statements, hearing their stories. And uh, at, the end of the, at the end of it all, uh, Justice Sinclair said that it was education that got in, into this mess, I mean, the, the whole Indian residential school experience. But it's also education that will help get us out of this mess. So that's why you know I accept every opportunity to speak to teachers, uh, to take part in these types of forums because it's it's important that all of us know uh, what the real issues are, what they mean, what they mean to us, what they mean to our kids, and what we can do about uh, what we can do to to change all that. So thanks for having us. Um, if you guys have any questions or comments. Yes, we have some questions that have come up um, in the chat box. So I encourage everyone um, who's able to, to put your questions in there. Um, so just wondering here, has there ever been a, an analysis or a, um, anything done in terms of determining how much money has actually been taken out from resource extraction on uh, on the lands, in comparison to the uh, little trinklings of money that flows back, I, I think there has been attempts to put a dollar amount on all that. If you look at the, you know the history of that, for for example, you know going back to 1905, uh, I think there's been some attempts, and I'm, I'm not sure if Luke mentioned this, but uh, you know, our treaty money that we get is four dollars a year, <laughs> four bucks. Yeah, let's just make sure everybody. Let's make sure everyone hears this. How much is it? Four dollars. Four dollars a a year. A first. year. Okay, just making sure everyone got that. Mind you, treaty five. Uh, they must have had better negotiators. They get five dollars. Oh, five dollars. Clearly, better negotiators. They had better negotiators, but uh, you know, in terms of the uh, just, and that's what drives me crazy. A lot of things drive me crazy, but one of the things that, I, that drives me crazy is the amount of money that's been extracted from our territory. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I got a senior government officials goes up to Sandy Lake and they had, you know, give out this big check, like ten thousand dollars to a youth center or something. Like that's our money. You know what I mean? It's just. But you know, I, I think that that's definitely an exercise that we should all uh, that we should undertake is to uh, calculate uh, the true sort of the uh, you know what what amounts that have been extracted and and uh, you know for for the future. As I said, you know, Ring of Fire is uh, the the next big uh, potential development in, in all of Canada, not just Ontario, but all of Canada. You know, they're you know the oil sands in there. In the in the West, for example, now it's uh, everybody's looking eyeing at the Ring of Fire, and, and you know you're looking at potentially trillions of dollars uh, that will come out from that uh, from that mine once uh, if and when it's developed. And let's talk a little bit about you know teachers. Here's great opportunities for you to do inquiry in your classroom. Let's look at some of the resources, the resource extraction, mining. Some of the what you know, you think about how much money has been made off of the diamond mine right beside Attawapiskat, for example. And how's the community in Attawapiskat doing? Not too good. Isn't that amazing, right? So, you know, let's look at the let you know, it's a great opportunity in education to start to yeah. connect the dots here. Right. And yeah, um, just on that, that was good. I think I'm, uh, I'm sure some of you that are on social media, you know, saw that article last month, you know, where they 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 sold a rare diamond that came from the Victor Mine at Wapskat. Fifteen million dollars, like for a little diamond like that, 15 million bucks. And yeah, probably, probably not one cent going back to the community. No. It, it never is. And what, yeah, what do communities get? They get pollution, they get no water, they, they, they get, get hockey like, jerseys for their hockey team. 
Or What's they that? Get, oh, they get hockey jerseys for their hockey team. Right. Okay. Or, or they get turkeys at Christmas time. Yeah, it's wow. Um, okay, question here. There seems to be a lot of misinformation out there with regard to what's happening in the East Coast. I want to address with I want to address this with my class next week. Mm -hmm. What treaties should I look at with my students? So I believe this is an elementary uh, class as well. Yeah, I think you know they, you know it's right in their social media platform. The uh, the social the the treaty is uh, what again? Look, seventeen. Yeah, I don't I don't know the exact year, but uh, but the the tre their treaties are called uh, peace uh, peace and friendship treaties. Peace and friendship series. Yeah, which is ironic, right? You know, here, here they are. Their chiefs are being beaten. How's up. the friendship <laughs> going? <laughs> not too not too yeah not, too, not very peaceful, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So I would encourage uh, teachers to um, maybe, maybe if you even if you Google Chief Mike Zach, you all that information will pop up. Yeah. The the peace and friendship treaties that they signed out there, and what they mean, you know what you know what they represent. Yeah, and I think it's a good point too to also be very critical around where your information is coming from. Um, you know, always try and go to primary sources. So we are sitting here with two primary sources of information. Yeah, don't believe everything that's on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Just be wary about Facebook posts. No, but um, right. And so making sure that we're privileging Indigenous voices and we're centering the people of which um, that this is involving. Um, be careful about how the government portrays things. Um, look at media sources and, you know, our media, um, you know, there's bias everywhere. So just be very mindful of that. And also just, I mean, there's been numerous reports that have been done over the past, the, the Royal Commission of Aboriginal Peoples in the 90s and, and the TRC report is a very valuable tool, a very valuable resource for teachers. That, and there's different sections um, to these reports that you can easily um, Mm -hmm. reference in whatever classroom that you may want to or whatever subject that you may want <laughs> yeah right like pick your inquiry like how many more inquiries need to be done MMI in terms of sure yeah so yeah you mentioned the rcap um there's the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls inquiry the calls to justice the trc calls to action i don't know how many more um oh, here you know, and that's trail? And yeah. I'll tell you another valuable report uh, mm -hmm. is the Ipper Wash Inquiry. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. The Ipper Wash Inquiry. But I also want to think about how many more inquiries and inquests is it going to take? I think we need to, like, enough's enough. At, at some point, you know, we need Canadians to, like, recognize that there's, uh, it's the same yeah. story over and over and over again. And just, and, and just the, the books that have been written by Indigenous authors over the last couple of mm -hmm. years. Uh, you know, there's just a resurgence of literature, yes. uh, including Tanya Talaga. I think she was trying to join in on, on this call with her oh, book. Oh, was she? On feathers. I'm not sure if she's on. Uh, but there's so many talented Indigenous writers out there. You know, Thomas King and, uh, you know, there's another, there's a, a new series on CBC, The Son of the Trickster, that was uh, Eden Robinson, a very just a powerful novel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it, it was really good to see um, you know, sort of indigenous storytellers come out and to be able to tell their stories. I mean, that's what you do. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Tanya Talaga is awesome. Seven Fallen Feathers and her Richard Wagami, podcast. Richard Wagami, yes. who has since passed away. Is... There's so many amazing people. So there's no excuse uh, today to say, like, where's the information? There's so much information. Yeah, no more Lord of the Rings or oh. Lord of the Flies or the, you know, the Mockingbird or... Oh, yeah, we're, we're trying to yeah. move that. Um, okay, so another question here is, I'd like to discuss the water issues of Miss Katanga um, with my class. Where could I get more background information? Yeah, right. Uh, I mean, it's it's sort of uh, probably the top three sort of media interest stories right now in the country. Uh, that's why, you know, we're both Chief Munias and I have been in the media quite a bit. 
but uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't totally count on the media to tell the full story. It's always slanted, right? It's always uh, you know whatever angle that they want to take to do a story. Um, so I would just you know uh, the, the community has a website, uh, Nishkandiga. .ca, I believe, so they have their own website. Um, and and then we also have our website as well, where, where we document uh, our community. So it's uh, www.nan.ca. Look, help me yeah, here. Look. Yeah, .ca. So we, we also have our website where we document a lot of the stuff. Um, yeah, those are the, the two that sort of come to my mind right away. Uh, and I'm sure there's more, but you can start there. Yeah, that, that's an important uh, project. I think just, uh, uh, I mean, and then, for example, like right now, like today, there are, in addition to Niskandia, there are 16 boil water advisories, 10 of which are long-term. My, my community, for example, has been on boil water advisory since 2004. Um, so 10 are long-term and six are long-term. Yeah, and like let's or, so, again, or what long term, six or short term. So let's say you know the community of in southern Ontario, Brampton, or um, or Toronto even, or a, I don't know, Etobicoke, a suburb of Toronto, suddenly did not have access to water, and maybe they went like <clears throat> two days, maybe they even hit a week. Like, what would happen? Well, a, a really good example is uh, what happened in Winnipeg, I think it was two years ago, like, it was a springtime, you know, mm -hmm. something happened with their system in Winnipeg, and just the uproar, you know what I yeah. mean? <laughs> Holy right. cow, it's the end of the world in Winnipeg, is, and then they fixed it in three days, like three days it was fixed. Whatever the problem was in Winnipeg, they quickly diagnosed it. Right. They put all the resources together to fix it and they fixed it in three days. And we haven't heard about a boil water advisory in Winnipeg since that time. So. So there's the question to be asking ourselves why. So we have, we live in a place where governments value certain huh? lives over others. Certain human lives are worthy of water and other lives aren't. So, you know, I put this back to the audience and the people that are listening, um, which is the majority are teachers. Yeah. Like, what and can that, we do yeah. about this? And I think that's, um, and I sort of referenced this yesterday when I was in uh, Niskanaya, that we need to begin to change that narrative, uh, you know, that that somehow we are not good enough. As in this, people who are not good enough, you know, we're not good enough to access a good quality healthcare system, or we're not good enough to access a good quality education system, or we're not good enough to access clean, safe drinking water. And we need to begin to change that narrative uh, with, with government, but, uh, but uh, more importantly, with our own kids. Yes. Like our kids need to know that they are good enough to get all these things, including clean, safe drinking water. Yes. There is another question here. There's actually a lot rolling in right now. Which is great. Um, so a question is, um, is there any or has there been any successful meeting of treaty obligations anywhere in Canada? That's a good question. Uh, you must have missed that meeting. I don't <laughs> know. Maybe there. Uh, you know what? I shouldn't joke about that. Um, I think, you know, governments you know, government officials, ministers, even the prime minister, you know, I think they, they have good hearts. You know, I think they, they mean well. Um, for example, you know, Justin Trudeau has come up, went up to Pekanskum. I traveled with him last year uh, to Pekanskum and hearing from students directly and wanting to do the right thing or to, wanting to do um, what is right and just. But a lot of times what we end up fighting is the machine, the, the bureaucracy that is so entrenched in the Indian Act and just the, 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 the racist, the colonial history of this country 
that's where that machine is rooted in. And, you know, you may have a prime minister that, uh, that says good, good things and means well and wants to do, you know, made all the well, well, advisories in that or across the country, for example. But once you try to work with that machine, you, it's almost impossible. And you probably heard him say three days ago that he's walking away. He's backing away from that, from that commitment. Mm -hmm. my my reaction was that's crazy like you know you're gonna abandon that commitment during a pandemic where we were telling our communities to community members to wash their hands and mm. sanitize your home and to clean your home with what you know this is a time to um, double down on these efforts to you know bridge those inequities or to you know bridge those gaps that you know the there are huge gaps in the living conditions. So, um, so it's going back to that question about um, a good meeting, I think it was, well, I would like to be involved in that meeting uh, when it happens because we have lots to talk about and, and there's so much work that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Another question here. Um, my question about education and jurisdiction is how many of our NAN communities have actually agreed to sign the agreement? Has Fort Albany and Keshechewan signed on? We're not there yet. We're not, yeah, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, what we signed uh, three, two years ago was just uh, an agreement in principle. And now our challenge that we have is to actually negotiate the real agreement, and I'm hoping we can do that fairly quickly. We're just laying the groundwork now. Uh, we, we need to hire a team, a lead negotiator, a technical team, a legal team to do this work. And I'm hoping we can do that in less than five years. Okay. okay. Yeah, our, our kids can't wait, right? Yeah. Okay, so there's a lot of questions here now. This is yeah, great. They're just, they're just yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. Just takes a couple to get it started, I guess. Um, okay, just give me a second here as I scroll back up. Um, okay, are you ready for this one? <laughs> this is about the land acknowledgements. Okay. Uh, our school board and school perform land acknowledgements and we have talked about and done them in the classroom as well. This has been happening for a few years. And while I think that this has been great to help raise awareness of whose land we are on, I'm wondering what next steps I might be able to take with my students. Uh, we've begun to explore whose land and native land maps to start conversations about whose land we are on and just uh, starting to use the resource uh, Spirit Bear's journey through reconciliation. I'm wondering what you might see as next steps after performing land acknowledgements and to help create positive steps towards reconciliation. Yeah, so yeah, so thanks for that question. So the, the province, uh, the provincial, provincial government uh, a number of years ago uh, created these maps. I'm sure you have these, Jody, somewhere. So these maps, like the, the province, and it lays out each provincial territory. So those are those would be valuable tools for you to have in your classrooms is to have these uh, treaty maps. And I'm sure they're, uh, they're readily available uh, through some sort of a website, uh, I assume under the, I'm not sure if it's under Education, Ministry of Education or Ministry of uh, Aboriginal Affairs. Um, so that, that's a valuable tool. Uh, for sure, um, and then the, uh, the, the the what was the second part of the question? The question again was uh, it was a long one. I guess it's really like I think that the gist of it was moving beyond just an acknowledgement. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and I know this may be difficult for someone. Like when you do an acknowledgement, don't don't read from a piece of paper <laughs> you know it sort of defeats the purpose of doing a lot of acknowledgement if you don't know it in here like in your in your heart 
um, what an acknowledge what you are acknowledging. You're not just acknowledging the land; you're acknowledging the people there. You're acknowledging their ancestors. You're acknowledging their children, the history. You're acknowledging everything. Um, and so that, that that would be you know make wherever you are, wherever your school is located, wherever you're living in this province. Um, educate yourself get to know that area get to know the uh the history of that area uh, because when you do a, a land acknowledgement it's more than just reading from a piece of paper mm -hmm. you're acknowledging the ancestors the spirits you're acknowledging the kids those that are with us now and those to come like you're you're doing everything and i really think um part. i think kindergartens kindergartners do the greatest land acknowledgements like they're so they're still totally in tune with the land and everything eh? i always yeah. love what they come up with uh, i remember i think maybe it was grade one i don't yeah, know it was a little class and they were happy them. yeah and that like what we asked them like what what would you do who do you acknowledge in a land acknowledgement and somebody said the dinosaurs yeah, the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. It's like you're right they were here we should the, the, the woolly mammoths. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I'm not, I'm not being critical when I yeah, say yeah. read from a piece of paper, but mm -hmm. make it an effort. Yes. To really yes. know it. That, yeah. So it cool. comes from your heart. Yeah. So it's meaningful, and also I'm really big on the calls to action. So, okay, don't just, you know, say for, it's like a checkbox item, right? Like you just acknowledge somebody or. Um, you know, territory, but what are you, what are you going to do? Like, what's your commitment? What are you going to work on? What's your, you know, reconciliation plan or, or something that you're living and doing? Um, I want to, I'm aware of the time and there's, um, I just want to, there's, oh, there's so many really great questions here. Yeah, let's read them. Uh, we can, yeah, let's read about. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, this one's a loaded one. This, <laughs> what are the reasons? Oh, sorry, I, I skipped over one. Um, we are reading Seven Fallen Feathers in my grade 11 course. What is the most important thing you hope students in Southern Ontario learn about the Seven Fallen Feathers and Anishinaabeyaski Nation? So I guess if you could, some of the big takeaway items or goals or, or learning. Yeah, is, I mean, Kids shouldn't have to die and while pursuing their education. Like to me, that's the bottom line. It shouldn't cost them their life to go to high school. And unfortunately, that's still a reality for many of our communities. Uh, we are still, we are building some high schools. For example, where Je Jethro Anderson came from, Casabonica, their high school is, go is going to be open uh, next fall. Uh, but you know we're not there yet with all the communities, and that's something we're we're working uh, to uh, you know, and, and we do this work to honor their memory and to honor their lives, and we still have lots of work to do. Yeah, no one should have to die to go to to attend school. Um, what are the reasons behind the boiled water advisories? What are the remedies? Why are there so many of these advisories for years? Well, uh, as I said, um, with a lot of things, whether it's policing or healthcare or building code or education or water, there are no, there are absolutely no standards at all uh, on reserve. The standards end at the reserve boundary. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the Program and services are funded based on a program, like an arbitrarily made up formula. That's how much communities get to, to run a service or a program. And it's it's creating, it's it's dangerous. It's creating harm. Um, and that's something that we should all be working towards is to create that set of, like fire safety, for example. You know, we've run what we call an Amber's Fire Safety Campaign over the last five years after uh, nine individuals in Bikanskim lost their lives in a house fire, including five-month-old Amber Shrine, uh, you know, the campaign that's uh, named after her memory. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're working towards creating standards on, on fire safety. 
Uh, and that's what we need to do in all these areas. Uh, we need to create standards on 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 water uh, to make sure that uh, that there's capacity in the community level uh, to be able to uh, uh, operate safely the these water treatment plants that uh, that are being built. Somebody really wants to get a hold of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So lots to do. Um, okay, a couple more questions and then we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, what are the challenges facing First Nation education authorities that would be participating in education jurisdiction if they had an existing remedial management plan? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know what the exact numbers are uh, in, in our territory that because of many factors, including underfunding, as Luke talked about, the, the funding gaps in education, for example, um, that a lot of our communities are in co-management or third-party management and that they need to create re remedial management plans to uh, um, effectively administer their funding in all these different areas so that they can uh, address their debt over a period of time. Uh, and once you're in third party management, it affects all aspects of the community, including healthcare, including education. And that's something that through the, the work that we're doing now is that we, that's gonna be part of it is, uh, you know, that whole, um, you know, fiscal relations uh, uh, process that we need to address as well. Uh, moving forward, right now we're doing that in child welfare. We need to do the same in education. So I think this last question is maybe a good one to close off on. Um, it's in regards to, it's the question is, what would you say to a child who thinks so many bad things have happened to indigenous people that they question how we can move forward with hope or positivity? And so I'm just gonna tag on to that question um, because something that we really try to, um, the messaging we give is that as much as we gotta tell these truths and that they are pretty, you know, we're talking about genocide, we're talking about land theft, uh, we're talking about human rights abuses, but we gotta counter that with stories of resistance, resilience, mm -hmm. with like there are incredible, people, Indigenous people who have done, you know, absolutely amazing things. Um, you know, Indigenous Veterans Day, for example, uh, you know, comes to mind. That's coming up actually in a couple weeks, November 8th, I believe, November 8th. So yeah, so to, to bring in, we have to balance the narrative as well and focus on, um, you know, because my kids who are also in the education system and um, I want them to see themselves reflected in really positive way as well. So I don't know if you wanna maybe answer that and we'll kind of close off with some closing words as well and we'll come to wrap this up, this session up. Yeah, no, thank you um, to the person that asked that question or that raised that, that issue. Uh, I think that that, that is so important uh, that we begin to change the narrative from, from tragedy to hope. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have so many uh, talented and committed and just great people in our communities right across this country. And we need to lift them up and celebrate them. And we need to make a point of getting to know them more, whether it's, uh, you know, I talked about Cheyenne Kustajan Mm -hmm. earlier and the important work that, he, that, that she's did that she did and the, and the legacy of her work that still carries on even though she was just only 15 or her life and work is so important even now and people like Cindy Blackstock you know uh, this incredible leader that is driving uh, change in so many areas uh, and, the, and the historic case that she first uh, uh uh, raised back in 2008, uh, the, the child, you know, the, the human rights tribunal case on child welfare, but leading to so many areas. Um, you know, and, and, you know, Autumn Pelche, you know, the, mm -hmm. one of our warriors 
who's uh, fighting to preserve water and to uh, uh, ensure that uh, our water rights are, are respected. Uh, and, you know, just, and so many talented artists and writers. I talked about literature yeah. earlier and just, uh, whether it's Richard Wagamese or, or Tanya Talaga, um, Thomas King and Eden Robinson and so many other, uh, to me, I, you know, it, it can be, once you start compiling that list, it can be a, a very long list. And I was involved in a, in a call uh, two weeks or a week ago with, uh, you know, there was an emergency meeting last week and, and talk about health and equi equity and racism in healthcare. You know, you know, the young mother that died in a Montreal hospital. Oh, yes. She was able to film her last few moments as the nurses and the staff were mocking her. And, and, and the meeting that happened as a result of that very um, racist uh, incident, uh, Joy Sejiquan was her name, a mother of four. Uh, and so there was a, an emergency meeting that happened uh, involving some ministers and I was on that meeting and we had so many talented young indigenous doctors that took part. And I was just so proud to, uh, to, be in, to be a part of that meeting and to hear them and see them and the work that they're doing. And, uh, and you can take any sector uh, in this country uh, and you will see in the people there more and more. And that's what we need to celebrate. That's what we need to build on. And as educators, you have that response. It's, it's a great responsibility, whether, you know, if you have a, you know, just to tell these stories. Yeah, just on uh, just to close off, I guess just on the uh, that Memorial Day that's coming up, just imagine that uh, World War II, uh, First World War, the, the two wars that uh, we participated, our veterans, uh, our people participated. Uh, just imagine that uh, when they enlisted, they weren't even considered as citizens. You mean in Canada? It wasn't until 1953. That the yeah, government, or, or when they came back, they yeah, lost everything. Yeah, when the government decided in 1953 to amend the uh, Citizenship Act, they retroactive that uh, Citizenship Act to 1941. So just imagine that uh, when they fought, they, they fought as allies, but when they came back, they, they were treated uh, as second second class citizens and they never got to enjoy the, the veteran benefits that they uh, that the then uh, that the uh, other the veterans, uh, the veterans got yeah they the they never got the land they never got the uh, free education that uh, so, so a lot of those even though the government apologized for that a lot of them refused to take it because because twenty thousand was the offer that they made and when you look at the uh, veterans non Aboriginal veterans that took the uh, the uh, the benefits they they, they uh, made uh, a good living because they lot them went to school because I know one of the uh, it was a good friend of mine that uh, that, that was part of that uh, second world war veteran he uh, he invited me to his house and and he said uh, it's, it's, it's a very uh, it's not it's not a bad it's, it's a good house and it's uh, not a very big but he's uh, he's uh, very comfortable on it and what he said is uh, he said this this is the uh, house that the government gave me after my uh, time in the army and also uh, he said uh, I was able to uh, continue my education right after the uh, war because the, the, the government paid for his education he was a chartered accountant so our first nations when they came back uh, they, they, those benefits were denied because the fact that the Indian Act prohibited uh, you know, property ownership so so again and so that's you know, when you think about those veterans, uh, they, they sacrificed a lot. They, even when they came back, they, they, they had to fight for their, for their benefits and freedom, which most of them never got. So, so I just wanted to point that out. It, it wasn't until 1953 that uh, First Nations became official citizens. Yeah, so remember and honor our veterans uh, on Remembrance Day. Mm -hmm. Yes, and not many people know uh, if not for the Anishinaabek, 1812, that was the Anishinaabek holding mm -hmm. that line, That's not right. the British. That's and right. for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, if not for the Anishinaabek, we'd be pledging allegiance to Donald Trump today. Mm -hmm. 
little fact. Yeah, you'd be boarding next Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so much information out there um, available that we hope we want to encourage all of you who are listening tonight, um, you know, keep seeking out information. You know, that's as educators, we are, that's part of our duty. We're lifelong learners. We are reflective practitioners. Um, you know, and if you're, if you're feeling like, like, why didn't I, why don't I know these things? Just remember that this has been very intentional from the beginning. We were never meant to have this conversation today. This is the plan. And so thankfully we are having the conversation today. I really want to um, extend my deepest and most sincere gratitude to both you Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler and Luke Hunter for spending the night with us here. And I know how incredibly busy you are. Um, I certainly, I just absolutely love both you and Tisa. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to Tisa because uh, who's Elvin's wife, but is also like, you know, <laughs> the one who's uh, always keeping it all together and doing so much of the in behind the scenes there. Um, big shout out to Tisa for the work that she does. And I just, before we close off today, I do want to just point out to everyone um, that on our website, uh, under the events tab, you will find this is where all of our recordings are and our upcoming live streams as well. So we have more conversations happening this week as well as some live streams right into classrooms. So if you want to um, get your students involved, we have some live streams available for them during actual Treaties Recognition Week, which does begin um, next week, the first full week of November. But as, as everything, it's not just a week, it's every day. So we hope that you can continue to look for ways to bring um, this into classrooms and that this becomes a part of learning every day. So again, um, thank you so much for spending the night with us. And if there's any last words you wanna share? Luke? Uh, no, just uh, thank you for inviting us. And certainly it's, uh, it's, uh, we always uh, take the opportunity to uh, make an effort to participate in these events. I know just today I, I had a three hour session on on a, uh, another webinar on, uh, on treating Aboriginal rights. So tomorrow I have another one that's on duty to consult. So I, I do a lot of these uh, frequently. Next week I'm, I'm booked for another one as well. So uh, to, to, to talk to youth so uh, on, on treating Aboriginal rights. So, so thank you for inviting us. And, and yeah. yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks again, everybody. Uh, thanks, Jody. I just want to acknowledge all the educators and, and teachers out there, um, just acknowledging the, the challenge that you're facing uh, right now with, uh, with this COVID uh, pandemic and how challenging it must be. And you're still here. You're still doing your job. And I just want to commend you for that and I wish you all stay safe. And uh, thanks again for having us. Thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. And I hope that we see you um, for the rest of our series. And with that, take care, have a good night, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Good night. Bye-bye.